How's it going, everybody? Brian Nelson, Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is July 31, 2022. Figure 4 online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. we got a lot to get into here today, Dave, including Ric Flair's last match. Well, if there's one thing that's very clear is that it, in fact, was Ric Flair's last match. Um, I don't think that you could ever do that again. Um, so... I don't know if that was a good thing. Um, I mean, it probably wasn't. I was very sad watching it. Um, I, there were things. The show was kind of fun to watch up until the main event. It wasn't like a perfect show or anything like that. But um, I liked the nostalgia, you know, just because I grew up watching that stuff. You know, like uh, the 605 and the set and David. Like, David Crockett is is by no means a great wrestling television announcer, especially by the standards of today. But for this show, I, you know, it was part of the nostalgia. You know, I was really loved seeing Bob Caudle. I loved the old pictures, Tony Schiavone. And I liked that they used the modern announcers to work with them. You know, like Ian and uh, and several of the others. And, you know, everybody on the undercard, it was a real big match for those people on the undercard because this was a bigger crowd than, um, aside from the guys who were at AAA, I mean, um, AEW guys and, and AAA guys, um, you know, this was a, and, you know, to a degree the New Japan guys, but this was a bigger crowd than most of them have performed on. So that was a big thrill. And, you know, it was a bigger show and all that. So they worked... As I expected, everybody worked very, very hard. And uh, the main event, um, I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that Rick came in hurt because if you watched, you know, the training footage and everything like that, I mean, it was very clear he could do far more when he started training, you know, in those clips with Jay Lethal than he could do tonight. I mean, he could not do really anything. And they had to, um, I thought Jeff Jarrett did a, a great job of, kind of work in the match um, using like old school you know lots and lots of stalling and things like that um, I you know Andrade was fine I mean the problem with Andrade this is not a negative is that is, is it's just the reality is that Andrade going out there and doing a super match would take the focus off of Ric Flair so his job was to kind of lay low and just kind of be the tag team partner the the week not the week that's that's the bad word but the um the b tag team partner who just kind of goes in there and always leaves the focus on rick so that was his job you know i mean it would be really cool for andrade to do you know pull out all those great moves and and all that stuff but uh you know it wasn't it wasn't the case um they you know they went 26 27 minutes and i don't know I don't know if it was ever. It it felt sort of scary. I mean, sort of times, scary. You know, I was scared of, half to death watching that match. Yeah, I I, I was kind of scared at certain points too. Um, I mean, the thing that the thing that I guess in a sense maybe the and I don't know if this was a good thing, but the fact that like I never saw like a doctor like rush to the ring. You know what I mean? But um, you know where I would have been scared to death. So I figured, you know, but but it was um, it was very uncomfortable for sure. You know, I watched a lot of the uh, training videos, him and Jay Lethal, and he looked way better in those than he did in this match. Like, yeah, like I said, yeah. And I I I was thinking about it because, you know, he, he came out and he was like he was moving really slow and he was really slow getting into the ring and he looked like he was kind of breathing heavy and. The match started, and, and he really wasn't doing anything, and Jeff Jarrett, there was all of this stalling, and I, th I I was just like, there's that part of me that thought, you know what, they're they're playing it up early, and there's going to be a spot where all of a sudden, like, he does some stuff, and he's going to... It, 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 well, he, and, did, and he, he, he did chops and punches. He did a couple funny. of things, but he did he did nothing like he had done in those training videos. No, not at all. And I, I think that, you know, to me, as someone who, who wrestled, you know, I... There were times where I would go out there for a match, and I would have a lot of pressure on myself, and you kind of almost blow yourself up before the bell even rings. 
And there were other times, and uh, one of them was the Jungle Boy match, actually, which was just a few years ago, where right before I went out, I just I kind of had it in my mind, like, dude, just go out and have fun. It's a performance. You know, it was just... I had a totally different mindset. It was like I was just going out to have fun. And it was it was so much easier that match than other matches that I did. So I, I kind of think that maybe, and he said in his post-match promo, all the pressure that he had on himself. And, you know, he talked about seeing Kid Rock back there, and Kid Rock told him I had the night off, and you're performing for me tonight. And I think that just all of the pressure and the stress and all of it coming to a head on this night... I think that he just did, blew himself up during his entrance. I think that it was just he couldn't go out there and be relaxed like he was in those training sessions with Jay Lethal. And I, that's the only thing that I can come up with because I saw those he and they might, weren't that long ago. He might have been hurt. I mean, he was hurt. His foot was hurt. I know that. Um, you know, I mean, he had an injury. You know, I mean, and, and, I mean, he brought it up, you know, the the foot injury. And it was an injury that a normal young wrestler would be out of action for about a month with. And I remember him telling me about it two weeks ago. And I was like, well, he's going to do the match. And he even said, if I have to shoot it up, I'm going to shoot it up. You know, I mean, because he's done that before. He's from that, that school where you, you know, you're hurting real bad. And there's people there waiting for you. And you gobble a bunch of Percocets. You know what I mean? I mean, that that was what 1980s wrestling, 1970s wrestling was. You don't miss the show, especially when you're Ric Flair and you're a main eventer. Um, so he's got that that mindset. But I think he was hurting. I don't know that, but um, he looked really hurting at the end. Well, he he was, just, he was, was clearly. I mean, there was. A, it looked because, like when because he... because it's one it's it's one thing. I mean, like out of breath is one thing, but the minute he came through the curtain and started walking. Well, yeah, you could see he stumbled when he came through the curtain. I mean, so. it wasn't it wasn't the guy that was in those training videos. No, he looked like an old man who was having a rough time walking. Yeah, and so I think I think what happened was at some point, you know, and and uh, believe me, I can to a degree relate to this. Not really, uh, obviously, not being a wrestler, but to a degree, you go to the gym. And, and, you know, he's been going to the gym for 55, 60 years, somewhere in that range. And you kind of, you forget when you're inside the gym and you're training, like all rash, I don't say all rational thought goes away, but it's very easy to forget your age and be stupid. Okay. Cause I, I am often stupid and it gets you hurt when you're older. Because you just think, hey, I feel great, and I can do this because I've always been able to do this. And now that I'm in the gym, I can do this. And you can even do it. It's a surprise. But the ability to do it does not mean you don't get hurt doing it. Well, yes, but but the other thing about the match was it wasn't even like he did a lot of very active things early and got himself blown up. I mean, no, no, no. I think he was hurt coming in. He was. I mean, he was for sure hurt coming in. But he he got so tired, and you know, even if you're hurt, you know, Jay Lethal should be able to lift him up and give him a vertical suplex, and he'll be okay because he'd taken those many times in those training videos. He took right. that one vertical suplex. And I think they were going to do a superplex because they lifted him they were, up to sit were, on the top they were, rope. They were they were, they were going to do a superplex. And he, yeah, and he came yeah. back down, and didn't want to take it. He took the normal suplex, he, and he, he never he, he literally he, he, from that point forward never got to his feet again after that one vertical suplex. No, he was laying there for a long time. Yep, and they tried to put the brass knuckles on, and his hands are shaking, and he couldn't get the brass knuckles. Oh, on. that was that was really scary. And then he got him on the other hand, and he managed to hit the punch. And then did the figure four, and literally, like, he got the figure four on, and then he collapsed. And the referee counted Jarrett's shoulders down for the finish, because he had Jarrett in the figure four. But, I mean, Rick's shoulders were down, too. He was laying there flat on his back. Yeah. So they gave him the win, obviously. But when the match was over, I mean, you could see him. He turned to Andrade, and he mouthed, I passed out. So yeah, he said, and, and he said he said he forgot. Um, two minutes. Yeah, he said, he, I forgot he, most of the match or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, he, uh, it was scary, dude. I was so scared watching that match. And, 
you know, there were there were periods where he was just laying on the mat for a long time, not moving. And the other guys were doing all the work, but it was almost like, shouldn't there be another referee out there just to make sure that he's okay? Because <laughs> he's was, over laying there by himself, and there's well, nobody over there checking on him. Well, that's the thing. is, like, I thought, like, but I guess that they decided not to throw. I don't know what it was, because in that situation, I would have thought, you got to send a doctor out there. Because that's what I was expecting when he wasn't getting up. Like, there was that one spot right, right after the suplex where it was just to me like, oh, my God. And it was, but the fact that they didn't do anything, and then like they gave, they wanted to give him water, and he couldn't drink the water. Remember that? I missed that. I did see the uh, spot yeah. outside where he pretended he had a heart attack, and then used that to do an eye poke. That was. Uh, I didn't even I did. see that one. I saw the eye poke, but I didn't. Um... Yeah, it was right before the eye poke. He clutched his chest, and then I think it was Jay Lethal. You know, acted like he was concerned, and then Flair was just fooling him, and he poked him in the eye. And they talked about he's the dirtiest player in the game by pretending he was having a, like a heart problem or something like that. Wonder- wonderful. Yeah, that was one of the spots. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, here. So the basic deal is just this: this can never be done again. And um, there were people live who. Well, certainly who, not with Ric Flair. No, no, no. You know, I would. Not. I would not put it past him to do another show like this because oh, there sorry, were a lot sh- of people there. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people at the pay per view. I'm sure it was a success. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, as far as promoting a show um but i don't know that you um i don't know that you can promote a jim crockett promotion show you know because without rick flair there's really no tie anymore um but i mean as far as you know conrad thompson promoting another independent show of course he can Uh, there's no reason not to um everyone does piggyback off these shows and he got a lot of people in you know the one thing that i thought was very interesting because um you know you had AEW guys all over the show and Jarrett is a WWE office guy, but not a wrestler. But, you know, the one thing that I was, you know, wondering um, is, because, you know, is especially with Karen Jarrett there is, is Charlotte Flair going to do a run-in? And obviously, the fact she was there and they had Megan do it instead of, you know, Megan to be the one who, um, you know, interacted with Karen basically me- must have meant that WWE said you can't. So even in this situation, and um, they did have some. Well, I think that to, to the I'm trying to remember if they had any WWE talent other than they did have Nick Nemeth, Dolph Ziggler, but they called him Nick Nemeth for a split second. In, and Cody Rhodes was was on. Yeah, we had Cody. We had Undertaker. He was there. But, un, but Undertaker's not an active wrestler. Well, no, but I mean he's WWE for life. Yeah, but there, but you can. There's no. There's no heat on. He doesn't have a contract that would prohibit him from sitting at ringside during an independent show. You know, whereas none of the, there were WWE people there and none of them were allowed to be on camera. Um, and it was just interesting that, um, you know, it, it, I, I mean, the key being is that we're trying to learn from, we got a new regime here, you know, with um, Paul and Stephanie and, and Nick Khan. Okay, Vince is out. And the Vince rules, you know, not, are not necessarily the rules anymore. The old rules, of course, I would not expect anyone. Um, but do you think that on a unique situation like this, Ric Flair's retirement, do you allow, you know, your guys to, you know, I mean, they weren't going to wrestle, but maybe do a run in, maybe just do a cameo, maybe do something at the end, you know. Uh, go to the ring with Ric Flair or whatever. And the answer was, the people who were there, the answer was, no, they're not allowed on. Whereas with AEW, you know, guys were allowed. Um, with Impact, well, of course, with Impact and those companies, not only were guys who were allowed, but they sponsored, essentially sponsored matches and had championship matches. Everybody other, you know, everybody else worked together. But it was interesting that, that even for Ric Flair's retirement, um, the old rules still apply. So, so, it appears that those kind of rules are not going to change because we got a new regime and and this was the test. You know, is Charlotte Flair going to be allowed to do something? And and obviously, obviously the answer was no. Do you watch the pre-show? Yeah, I mean, it's only two matches, um, but um, you know, it was it was most you know a lot a lot of clips that they ended up showing on the pay per view as well. You know, the same clips with uh, you know almost all of them. Cody Rhodes. There were a, actually two different clips of Cody Rhodes um and then you know um 
just uh, whatever Layfield and Kurt Angle and you know interesting also you know no no Paul Levesque, um yeah or or you know anyone from uh, Sean Sean was there but those were the Sean was from like a podcast because like did you know that you were going to be on I did not okay you were on well you know you were on yeah I saw the video but yeah. I, I did not know no yeah yeah um, they were doing um, but. I mean, I think that that stuff from, you know, whatever, you know, Sean, but, but Sean's also, he's in the company and everything like that, but he's also not an active wrestler and he did go on TMZ and, and, uh, you know, talk about it. So it was interesting that, that, uh, but it was interesting. No Paul Levesque on it, um, considering they've been very close in the past. Um, but maybe, you know, it also could be, maybe he didn't want to be, I could see from his standpoint uh, him not wanting to be associated with it in case something bad happened, you know, you, you, you know what I mean? Because then you're, it's, it starts looking like, oh, you know, you're, you know, the, the head of WWE creative was, was on the show. So maybe WWE is involved and this might be, if I'm WWE, um, this would probably in that sense, as far as like Triple H, Levesque, it would be something that I would want to, in that, for him, I'm not saying for the talent, but for him, that might be something that it's good to not be part of just in case, you know, because the one thing, you know, like obviously the concerning thing, I mean, hopefully he's OK. And I, I know that when the show was over, um, I heard like from from people backstage that they got him out of there real fast. So wherever he, you know, he, he wasn't there's a big party of people for him and he he was out of there. So wherever he went, I don't know if, you know, he said he was, didn't he say he was going to go out and go out drinking tonight or something? He said he was going to go party with Kid Rock. Maybe, who knows, maybe he did. He didn't look in any shape to go out partying, though. Um, but uh, I thought, you know, Jeff Jarrett was like the right person to put against him. I mean, I kind of figured he would be, you know, and they did the angle. The angle was good. Jay Lethal knew, you know, what he could and couldn't do. Um, it was just sad. I wish that, you know, like Rick did all that training and probably this would have been better before he did all that training because it, it's, he probably hurt himself training so hard as opposed to, you know, I mean, just trying so hard to get in the best shape possible. And, you know, by doing that, he may have, um, he may have pushed himself or maybe it was just, the, you know, you know, different injuries and stuff, you know, taking those bumps, no matter what, when you're that age trying to take those bumps, I mean, um, it was, you know, again, he had said whatever he had said. He'd said he was going to be better than 2009, and obviously that wasn't even close to the case. But, um, you know, he did look good in the in some of those training segments, and uh, this was not good. Hey, if you're a big fan of Wrestling Observer Radio, we got 12,000 episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website, WrestlingObserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week. You can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work, working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com. 12,000 audio shows at your fingertips.